<clears throat> All right, welcome everybody um, for our next talk. Susan is going to talk to us about proxy panes and benefits to supporting HTTP2 end to end. Uh, take it away, Susan. All right, thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, so in today's talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing uh, with implementing H2, specifically H2 to origin uh, in Traffic Server and uh, some of the pains that we had there, some motivations on why we're doing this, giving a little bit of history of where Traffic Server is with supporting various protocols, our design implementation, some issues we ran into, and then some longer term performance um, concerns, things that you probably have to be thinking about as you're rolling out H2 to the origin. And make sure I'm on the right screen here. There we go. Uh, so again, uh, anything very big is a team effort. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in the last year working on this. I'm a traffic server committer. This is work that was performed while I was at Yahoo, Verizon Media, Oath. Um, I have recently moved to Aviatrix, so there's going to be less traffic server for me for a while. Uh, Aaron Canary also did some of this work while he was at Yahoo. Brian Narat uh, did some work for testing uh, HTTP2 to origin. And he is taking over the testing torch at Yahoo. So he's going to be pushing things forward. And I think he's on the call, so he can answer questions on chat as well. And in addition, Mazakatsu and Masori have been deeply involved in reviews and design discussions. And they are driving forces in both HTTP2 and HTTP3 development in general within Traffic Server. So what is our motivation? So Traffic Server today, current releases, they offer clients both HTTP 1X with and without TLS and HTTP 2. But to origin, Traffic Server only offers HTTP uh, 1X with and without TLS. Um, you know, and the idea was in the reverse proxy case, you want to roll out the new protocols to the client first and your origins, well, you know, they'll deal with whatever and maybe they're kind of slow anyway. But there are use cases for HTTP to origin as well. So for forward proxies, it's going to give you a more transparent experience. Uh, for reverse proxies, there can be origins that are smarter, and as I'll show later, can do a lot more with reusing connections in this uh, newer protocol. And then there are also just the ability to proxy newer protocols like gRPC, which are inherently built over um, HTTP2. Uh, so currently, uh, Traffic Server cannot proxy a gRPC request because it requires H2 on both sides, which we don't have. And I will remember to be on the right screen. There you go. So let me start off with some history about where we are and uh, where all this pro protocol support came in because it kind of informs why we kind of went about things the way we did. So more than eight years ago, ATS only supported uh, variants of HTTP, you know, 0.9, 1.0, 1.1, both inbound and outbound. Um, and about eight years ago, uh, the community started to add support for some of these newer protocols, specifically Speedy. So they added support for Speedy, which is a precursor to HB2 inbound. And it was implemented as a plugin, wrapped in the plugin VC, uh, which was good, you know, for this initial implementation, keeping it out of the core. That's lovely. But trying to debug through the plugin VC was really awkward. So it was very awkward to debug and to performance tune. Um, then Speedy was a very transient uh, protocol, so very quickly uh, came HTTP2, and that was brought in about a year later. Again, that first version was wrapped in that plugin VC um, plugin. So about six years ago, uh, I kind of came into this fray, and uh, one of the reasons that H2 was being kept in the plugin is because the state machine, HPSM, really uh, had um, has a reference to the incoming connection and the outgoing connection. And those those that logic was really deeply wrapped around HP 1.1. Uh, so the state machine had all kinds of details about how HP 1.1 works for both the in, for the client and for the server side. And so uh, splitting that so that you, you the inbound side could be H2 or H1 required pulling a lot of stuff out of the state machine and introducing an abstraction layer, which is the work I did uh, with TS3612, uh, which was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of work. Uh, so uh, with that, we introduced a concept of proxy section and proxy transaction. And then that code change then changed from 
the state machine directly referencing an HTTP1 client session. And then instead said, well, you're just going to reference this proxy transaction, whatever it is. You don't get to know the details. So this code all landed in traffic server 6.x. Um, and unfortunately, this was probably a reason that 6.x was a little unstable. And I'll, I'll talk about kind of how things are a little better in that case now. But um, for, yeah, it kind of maybe landed a little too soon. We didn't have very good integration tests. So things were a little wonky there in the 6.x time frame, in, in part because of this PR. But because of the PR and because of the abstraction layers that we, we added, we were able to then move H2 from the plugin into core. Um, so that is the history. Um, and here is some of the class restructuring that was done to support that uh, abstraction on inbound proxy uh, manipulation. So everything inherits from a B connection. Our HPSM has a UA transaction member, which refers to the proxy transaction. The proxy transaction is either an HTTP1 client transaction or an HTTP2 stream as a concrete class. And the proxy transaction has a member that points to the proxy session that it's part of. So all sessions will have a number of proxy transactions associated with them. Uh, in the newer HTTP3 work, there is an HTTP3 stream or client transaction. I forget what their nomenclature is, but the, the, um, as we're adding new protocols, once you have this abstraction, lining up another one is relatively straightforward. And then for the session hierarchies, again, we inherit from B connection, there's a proxy session. And then there are two concrete classes in either an HTTP1 client session or an HTTP2 client session. Um, the client session, for various reasons, a lot of the information in the session is actually stored in a connection state, which is a member. Uh, and again, the proxy transaction has a proxy session uh, member, which then points to a proxy session instance. So nice and abstract. And so this cleaned up things uh, for a goodly amount on the inbound side. Again, we've been supporting multiple inbound uh, protocols for a number of years now. But we haven't dealt, built, bit the bullet and dealt with cleaning up the outbound side. So within the HPSM in the current releases, it's still server session. It's only uh, referring to an HP1 server session. And, and there's still within the server pooling, server session pooling and a lot of the state machine logic, a lot of assumptions about HTTP1 when talking to the origin side. So uh, in, 2018, uh, kind of like late 2017, early 2018, I had some time um, around the holidays. And so I did some prototyping of H2 to origin. And you know how prototyping works. You know, you get the 80% there in like 20% of the time or 10% of the time. So uh, things were going great guns in my head, little one-off things working in my dev environment. Thought, oh yeah, we'll get this out by the end of the year. Um, in parallel, Kays uh, also uh, was working, he had a proprietary implementation of H2 to origin working for a customer, uh, but the customer didn't want to open source it. And it was using the NGHP2 library. So it was a little, it was good to explore some ideas, but it was probably not the long-term solution for traffic server. And we made presentation on this at the court summit, and there's a, a link to the presentation there. Uh, but it was interesting. We both went at it from different perspectives. So he came up with some ideas and issues that I hadn't thought of. And, and my work coming from more of a CDN, ADN perspective, um, I had different issues that I came into with. So it was good that we were both doing some preparatory work there. Uh, but then life hit for me and uh, other projects took over traffic server and not traffic server. And I didn't really get back to the H2 to origin until late 2020. In the meantime, Aaron Canary had done some work in the area abstracting out the HTTP1 server session so pulling the details out, not making it multi-protocol, but at least pulling some of the details out of the HP1 server session and uh, replacing it with a general server session class. Uh, and there's a link to the PR in the slides, which hopefully will get posted someplace. And, and this logic is a 9-1 right now. Uh, in March of this year, I set up an H2 to origin PR. And I think the current plan is to roll that out in 10. And in the meantime, I also have set up two other PRs, which I think have landed. 
uh, as preparatory work. One is um, doing some more of that outbound protocol separation from the HPSM, specifically making a server transaction. So the server transaction is pointing to a proxy transaction. It's still only implementing the HTTP one case, but at least we've structurally made the state machine more generic, more like the client side. And uh, also landed the HTTP two session class separation, uh, which will make keeping everything in sync a lot easier because while I'm making these outbound changes to the HP2, work in HP2 is not just idle uh, because uh, Missouri, I think specifically is doing a lot of cleanup performance enhancement work in H2. So keeping all that in sync is challenging for a long lived, long -lived feature branch. So the current status for this uh, HTTP2 to origin work is um, uh, Yahoo is doing production testing of a 9.1 branch. So uh, before I left, I was uh, leading that effort. And uh, now, now Brian Narrett is, um, I believe uh, they're, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that more. Uh, hopefully other groups will work with this branch. Uh, so like I said, we're testing that. So we are taking um, what the current PR is, or kind of a, an evolved version of the current PR, because I need to update the PR, but uh, brought that back to our 9.1 branch in addition to some other um, H2 cleanup PRs that made that uh, rebase a lot easier. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, we're aiming to land this in 10, uh, but hopefully, um, you know, Yahoo will be getting some experience with this, uh, but hopefully some other groups will also be doing some early looks at H2 to origin. And uh, so again, everyone has a slightly different environment and they're gonna run into slightly different things. So the more people to kick the tires, earlier, the better. So here are the class hierarchies in the branch, which has been, has been expanded to deal also with uh, server side. So the proxy transaction class is pretty basic, pretty much what you would expect. Um, we have um, the V connection, the proxy transaction like we had before. Uh, our state machine now has a UA transaction and a server transaction members. Um, the, um, H, we used to have in the previous uh, slide, HP1 client transaction and an HP2 stream. And so the HP1 class uh, case, we've split that out. So there's an HTTP1 client transaction and an HP2 server transaction and a shared abstract HTTP1 transaction. In the stream case, we didn't make both a client and a server stream. The logic was all pretty common. Uh, there is a flag in there that's indicating whether it's outbound or not that, that we can use to distinguish between inbound and outbound cases, but it's not used super widely. The proxy session hierarchy gets a little bit more complicated um, because in the session case, uh, we're really trying to split on two dimensions, right? We want to split on client server, which is what the main uh, inheritance here is doing. So we have our proxy session and we have client session. So the HP1 client session and the HP2 client session. And we have server sessions that all inherit under poolable session. This was the general class and working from home is great. The UPS guy is here. Um, the Poolable session uh, is the parent class for the HP server session, the HP1 and HP2 server sessions. Uh, but in addition, in the HTTP2 land, there is a lot of commonality between the client session and the server session. So we also want to split on client and server, and we want to be able to share commonness there, uh, common aspects of the client and the server uh, HTTP2 sessions. So ideally we'd want to have multiple inheritance, inheritance splitting in two directions. And, and basically that's what we're doing. Uh, we have a mix in um, inheritance, an HP2 common session with both the HP2 client session and the HP2 server session in, inherit from. Uh, otherwise we'd have to cut and paste a uh, vast amount of common code between the two sessions. So there we are with that. So that's the, uh, the basic class structure of the, uh, the branch and the changes. 
How we uh, turn on HTTP2 to the origin is with a setting. Uh, so if you recall, if you've played very much with HTTP2 on the client side, uh, it's generally on, you enable it via the um, server ports, but with the, within the SNI YAML, you can turn it on and off for particular domain names as, or SNI names as the client's making requests. Uh, for the origin side, we have a setting uh, called proxy config SSL client ALPN protocols. And by default, that's empty, and that will just do our original HTTP1x behavior. Uh, so always negotiate HTTP1. But if you set that to the string h2, comma HTTP1.1, then that's going to be the ALPN string that Traffic Server will offer to the origin when it's trying to negotiate. And so it's going to offer h2 and HTTP1 to origins. And if the origin can do h2, then it will neg negotiate h2. Um, we did some uh, tests in our clients a few months ago just to see what kind of ALPN strings our clients were giving us. And most are going to offer H2, HTTP 1.1. Others, uh, there's like some long tail of really weird, odd combinations of speedy and pre-release versions of various things. Um, but in any case, uh, H2, HTTP 1.1 seems like a good thing. The other thing to note here is that this setting is overwritable, which means that in the remap.config, you can uh, change the value of this for particular um, domains. So if you know that certain domains do, will, will negotiate H2, but they don't do a very good job of it, uh, you can do a remap config. You can set by default this H2 HP11. And then for you know, badorigin.com remap rules, you can change the setting to be empty or just to be HTTP11. And in fact, in my later testing, that's exactly how I was running this. Actually, I was running the inverse. I had it off by default, and then I knew there were some origins that were good, and I turned it on for them. And we'll talk about a little bit more on that going forward. So some issues that we ran into during the implementation. Um, this is one that actually didn't occur to me at first, and this is one that Kay's would pointed out, is the issue of connecting to origins. So here we've got a scenario where we have a user agent and it's making 50 requests to foo.example.com. And uh, our traffic server is going to remap that to origin. And for whatever reason, this is pure proxy, it's just not cached, there's no cache hit. So we're going to have 50 requests going to origin. Now in the HTTP 1.1 case, uh, assuming that there's no sessions uh, already sitting in our session reuse pool, we are going to set up 50 HTTP um, connections to the origin, new connections. And that's probably, and it's not great, but that's probably our best option because HTTP 1.1 does not allow for simultaneous connection requests. So if you really want to get those connections through in the fastest possible time, you're probably best off making a new connection and trying to make that request as soon as possible. But with HTTP 2, you can multiplex requests, uh, multiplex requests on the same session. So you're probably better off setting up one or two connections and multiplexing all your transactions over those two sessions. The other reason that you would not want to set up 50 H2 uh, session requests is that uh, setting up an H2 session is more heavyweight than setting up an HTTP 1.1 session. Not only are you doing your TCP and your TLS handshake, but you're also exchanging some frames to getting it into a state where you can start making requests. So if the goal is to reduce uh, kind of smooth out bursts of requests so we don't make stupid number of uh, new requests to origin for H2, uh, we need to add some logic. And the H2 branch adds this concept of a connecting pool. So the logic looks at the host DB entry for the origin to see what the protocol we last negotiated when we talked to that origin. And if it was H2, then we go and look at the connecting pool to see if there is already a, a session that's being negotiated. And if it is, then we add our current request to the queue for the existing request. And then when the session is ready, uh, it's completed, we've exchanged the frames, it's ready to accept transactions or streams. And then we signal all the queued state machines to say, hey, go and do your thing. If we guessed wrong and it was an HTTP 1 session that got negotiated, then we'll signal one of the state machines to go ahead and then the others that were queued up will get a signal to say, oh, hey, sorry, go ahead and connect directly and it'll start over so we can recover. Um, there's a certain amount of logic here too that if we have a thousand requests, we don't wanna queue those all up. 
that's way too many for one H2 session. So there's um, currently a hard coded number, I think 50, uh, which should probably be a setting. Uh, and if there's more request queue than that, then we'll stop and uh, we'll start up another request to the origin. And that's worked out pretty well. Another issue that we run into is origin session reuse. Uh, so traffic server allows for session reuse. Um, there is this session pool. And uh, when traffic server is going to try to talk to an origin, it first looks in the session pool and sees if there is an idle origin session. And if there is, it pulls it out of the pool, makes the request on that session. This is all for HTTP 1.1. For HTTP 2, it's a little different because, again, HTTP 2 allows for multiplexing. So that's good. Uh, so when we're talking to origin, we go, we look in the pool and we see, oh, hey, there is a session. And if it's an HTTP2 session, we can just pull a stream off of that. We do not have to take it out of the pool because someone else at the same time can go and use that session at the same time, which is nice. We get more reuse, we get more concurrency. Uh, however, this concurrency gives us some limits on how we can treat sessions within the uh, reuse pool specifically in the case of the global session pool. So Yahoo runs with a global session pool enabled. This means that any transaction, any state machine running from any thread can request an origin out of that, a session out of that or, um, origin, uh, out of that pool. And if it's not associated with the thread that that state machine is running on, it will move the transaction, the HP, sorry, the HP one session over to its pool. This traffic server makes this assertion that as we're processing the state machine, that state machine and all the network IO, all the incoming client side network IO, all the origin side network IO needs to be on the same thread. This greatly simplifies our locking and uh, just makes life a whole lot better, performance uh, much, much better. But in the, um, in the case of H2 to origin, we can't do this movement, right? It's quite possible and, and quite probable, actual, actually, that uh, we have an H2 session in our pool. It already has a stream active. And if that stream is on thread one and you try to move the session to thread two, that IO is now going to move to thread two and that's going to break the session that's running, or sorry, this trend, the state machine that's running on thread one. So for H2 origins, you have to run with hybrid or thread pools. Uh, and in my testing, I was running with hybrid pools. Uh, and the question on the channel, if a client comes in as HP one x can ATS make its origin connection over H2? Yep, certainly. Uh, certainly in this uh, proxying case, whatever protocol you're in on incoming and whatever protocol you're on outgoing really doesn't matter. We can mix and match and that works out just fine. Uh, just like you can come in without TLS and go out using TLS or vice versa. Right, so that's uh, kind of the big design issues that we ran into fairly early on and, um, and got, um, got through and, and then started testing. And, and Rob asks, is the number of H2 origin connections sessions configurable? Um, it is configurable in the same way that the H1 origin sessions are, there's a per, server max connection setting that would apply to both. Um, I, think, I think that answers that. Um, so moving in, uh, before I went into production testing, integration testing has been a godsend, uh, I have to say, uh, certainly compared to my experience with making these similar changes on the inbound side. Uh, presence of AU integration test suite, say what you will about AU test, it's kind of a pain in the butt sometimes, but um, having these end-to-end in -end integration test suites have caught so many stupid unintended side effects. As I'm adding features, as I'm taking um, code PR review comments and putting them in and saying, oh, surely this will not hurt anything. And then I run it and it, I don't know, breaks some sort of logging feature, which I would have never noticed, right? Uh, until we're in the field for uh, a month or two. So um, integration testing, big win. Uh, and it certainly has kept the H2, HB2 feature branch, pretty stable. 
The other aspect of testing is proxy verifier. So proxy verifier is a tool um, Alan and Brian Narrett uh, have been writing um, to take in a file that describes a bunch of traffic. And then there's a, a client and a server, and they both read this, I think it's a JSON YAML file that describes the traffic. The client can be configured to run at certain bandwidth or certain RPS rates. We'll send the request through, through traffic server, and then the client the verifier server sits on the other side and sends the responses based on what's in our traffic description file. And early on, Brian added H2 to support to the server side. We already had it on the client side, uh, but at the time we didn't support H2 to origin, so I didn't put it on the server side and Brian added that. And so that was very useful and it was used to make the origin H2 to origin tests on the HTTP2 branch. Uh, so, uh, and there's links to the test. So, the, there are only two tests, but actually the replay files are, are reasonably complete and you always are going to need more test cases, but at least we've got something, which is good. So we, we made things happy in our integration tests and then um, went into production testing. So I started some limited production testing within Yahoo at the end of 2020. Uh, so the first phase, as always, is just getting stability. So for about a month, I would take a box. I would start up traffic server, bring it into rotation. It would crash within a few minutes. We take it out of rotation and stare at the core for a while. Go back through integration testing, you know, rinse and repeat. But after about a month, um, we were running stably. Uh, it would run, it wouldn't crash. Um, and then I spent the rest of 2021 uh, working and uh, teasing out performance issues. Um, my production uh, testing uh, it was in our Yahoo Edge environment, which um, I guess I should also point out is probably a little different than most of, of you. Uh, we are running both caching and also pure proxying. Uh, so the pure proxying case means that we do proxy post commands, for example. Uh, I know that I always surprise Comcast folks when I talk about, oh, but in the post, this is a problem. And they, and they say, oh, why are you proxying posts? Uh, because we're also, Yahoo's also doing uh, application proxying. Our origins were a mix of traffic server, Nginx, Istio. Possibly there were other things in the mix, um, but the, those were the three main servers that I, I was interacting with and, and it was running into issues with. Uh, and it was good to have a mix because uh, certainly I ran into unique issues with each of those three origin types. Uh, and so again, made the resulting product more resilient. Um, oh. Right, so, so most of the performance issues, uh, certainly uh, towards the end there, were um, less about you know, horrible performance problems. It was more looking at the numbers of uh, error cases. And it wasn't huge error cases, but you know, our, our, error, our number of error client aborts would climb from you know, one per second to 50 per second. So certainly noticeable uh, and, and concerning and enough that the timeouts were, were causing um, increases in our average TTMS. So we see increases in client aborts, client read errors, uh, and uh, in timeouts in general. And one observation, uh, it was kind of a um, problem, uh, an issue with uh, a protocol like H2. It's beautiful that H2 multiplexes, you have a bunch of active streams on an H2 session. But if for some reason you have a session failure on that H2 session, so you're sending a go away failure, which says go away now, shut down everything, bad, bad, bad. In the case of um, an HTTP1 session, right, you only have one active um, uh, state machine that's going to be impacted by uh, the, co the connection shutting down. But in HP2, if you have a very active origin H2 session, you could have 50 other active state machines that have streams active, or 100 maybe, or active on that connection to the origin. And so a go away, a failure on one state machine, one, one communication that is so bad that it, it, the spec says you have to send a go away frame means you're going to kill off 50 to 100 unrelated uh, HTTP state machines that are also talking to that origin. So any kind of protocol level failure is going to have a far bigger impact with H2 than they did with HTTP1. So you need to be very, very careful and not make protocol failures. 
Um, there are several fixes that were just general, and I'll talk about those that are queued up for 9.2. And uh, also I identified some uh, configuration changes uh, that we'll talk about. So one of the general fixes is um, this PR, link the PR there, uh, where the draining process for H2 was using the connection header, specifically the connection close header to signal that the HTTP2 session should start shutting down. So in general, HTTP2 should be ignoring connection headers. They have no meaning within the HTTP2 um, protocol. And uh, presumably that's why uh, folks who implemented the draining process said, oh, hey, no one's using this header, we can use the header. Uh, so if you do um, traffic CTL server drain, then that's gonna signal to your state machine, your HTTP2 processing to start adding these connection close headers. Um, however, the logic in the HPSM uh, didn't get the memo on that. So HPSM, the state machine, will generally just set the connection header to close anytime we have a failure um, parsing headers or some sort of communication failure with either side where we think we might leave junk on the wire in the case of HTTP 1.1. Uh, so for example, in a smuggling kind of attack, right, which has been a big cleanup thing for us in the last year or so, um, you, you have a bad header, you're getting it from the client or from the, from the server, you've got a bad header, you don't know what else is going to, you're going to shut things down, you don't know what else is on the wire, just to be safe, the state machine adds a connection close header there to say, oh, hey, tear yourself down. And the writer of that, me in some of that cases, was just assuming, well, HTTP2 is just doing to ignore all of that. But no, the HTTP2 was not going to ignore all that. Uh, instead, it would randomly shut things down uh, from the perspective of, of me, the person who's evaluating what's going on with timeouts. It would finish uh, all the existing streams, so that's good. Uh, we wouldn't get so many timeouts there, but the uh, amount of reuse that you could get on a connection to an H2 connection to origin was going to be truncated, right? So instead of sticking around for minutes or hours, it would probably you probably run in, in in the case where you're reusing, it's probably going to uh, run into one of these bad cases within a couple minutes. Uh, so that is a fixed mark for 9.2. We have it in our 9.1 and uh, trying to get that rolled out to our next level origins. The other issue that we ran into, um, which again is, is lined up for 9.2, is dealing with origins that return eerily on post requests. So again, you guys probably don't care too much about this because this is post, but um, there was a problem where um, the original traffic server processing, it was very surreal, right? So you would if you got a post request, we'd send up the, the request to the server, and then we'd send the post body, and then we'd start to read the response. There are cases in, in Origins, and we were running into one that would return a 508, 50x response if it was overloaded. It wouldn't even bother to read the post body because it's overloaded. Big post body, don't care, 50x, go away. And, and this was causing odd behavior, timeouts, um, just not good things. So uh, we have a PR that uh, will both, while it's sending the post body, also try to handle a um, response and kind of clean things up. Uh, and that helped um, that particular origin work a lot better. Uh, kind of a related thing that came out through testing was this issue with expect headers in 100 continuum, but um, that's also fixed. So those are, are kind of two general things. And in the course of debugging, there were other kind of more subtle issues just in the HP2 implementation, outbound implementation. One of them was how I was dealing with outbound stream ID assignment. Uh, so the spec says that if you are a HP2 implementation and you're getting uh, stream requests from your, your client, uh, this, the stream request will come in with ID set and the IDs better be monotonically increasing. So if you get a request for stream with ID um, nine, then you get one for seven. Well, that's a, an error and that will send a, I think that's a protocol error. We'll send it go away. So it's bad. So the original implementation, um, just when we allocated a stream object, we, we'd set the ID uh, because that's what we did in the inbound case, because in the inbound case, the client is giving us the ID and that's fine. 
But in the outbound case, we're selecting the ID, but there can be some time gap between when we create the stream object and when we actually send it out on the wire, thanks to hooks and plugins and other fun things. Uh, so obviously we, we fixed that so we don't assign the ID until we are actually sending the request out on the wire. And that fixed things up and I think that's something that we debugged against an Istio, an Istio server. So an example of having um, good having multiple different origins to test against. Another thing that I spent a lot of time fighting with was uh, dealing with max concurrent stream overruns. Uh, and again, these, this was a case where we're really hammering on an origin, uh, this particular origin is very, very active and we're doing a lot of reuse on it. Uh, so in the H2 spec, there's this uh, setting called max concurrent streams, uh, which defaults to 100. And this is a number that we exchange at the beginning of time. Uh, each side says to the other, I will only handle this many streams. Uh, and then it's up to uh, if the other side gives us another request to say, make another stream and it's over our limit, uh, then we'll send a reset. It's not a, a connection failure. Uh, and in the get case, that's probably fine. But in the post case, we've probably already set, you know, so say we've asked for stream 236. 237. Um, we've sent the, the request header for that. And if it's a post, we've probably already sent a data frame uh, with that ID on it. So the, the header will result in a reset. The data frame's already in play. That will come up with an invalid stream ID, which results in a connection failure, which will take everything down. So uh, the code, um, we should be able to track things pretty well, but we want a little bit of slack. So the H2 to origin code tracks how many active streams it thinks the peer has. And if we're within 90% of the limit, uh, we won't create a new stream on that session. Instead, we'll take that session out of the reuse pool and we'll look for another session or make a new session. Uh, as streams shut down, once the, the, the limit reaches um, 50%, then we'll put it back into the session reuse pool. And that made things uh, a lot better. Um, there's still some edge cases where I'm running into kind of get out of sync. Uh, so I think those, there's more debugging in this space. Um, some of the uh, performance issues just ended up being uh, config related. Um, the first one was reducing the keep alive for our origin session timeouts. Uh, and this is for us mostly because we were moving from a global pool to a hybrid pool. And uh, this was increasing our total number of origin session counts. It's unclear whether this was really causing a performance problem, but this, this is a signal that our ops team, if you see the number of origin counts go up quite a lot, they, they get very concerned about that. And it wasn't really increasing our connection reuse. So um, I think our, our keep alive for the HTB1 were like 90 seconds. Uh, and if you have a HTTP one session that is not in the global pool, but is lingering off in a thread pool, and it's not a super active session or an origin anyway, you, you not, it's not going to be reused in 90 seconds. You're probably fine. I, I took them down to like 20 seconds, and that greatly reduced the number of idle sessions sitting about. The other bigger thing uh, was getting our head around the HTTP2 window sizes. And I got a five minute alert, so we'll talk about data windows in five minutes. It'll be great. Um, so HTTP2, the protocol has a concept of data windows, um, much like TCP data windows, and the idea is the same. You want to be able to have a certain amount of data out processing, but not too much. You don't wanna overload uh, the, the other side. So you send data, you wait for a response from the other side, kind of update your window and send more data. So you don't want to overrun your window. You don't want to overrun buffering. For the H2, that's probably the biggest thing is if we just sucked in data as fast as we could, if the other side wasn't fast enough, you're just going to explode the buffers and, and, and dramatically increase your memory usage. Um, so here we're showing a scenario, um, our H2 clients uh, and servers exchange a, a set of settings at the beginning. One of those settings is the initial window size. The default is 65535. Uh, you can set it to whatever you want, well, bigger than 65535. 
And so in this scenario, the client is making 50 get response requests. Their server is going to send data frames for 50 response bodies. Once the client has finished processing the data, it's going to send window updates to the HP2 server saying, OK, um, you know, I've, I've processed the data. You can send me more data. So if everything is small, this is great. It will just run without pause. But some things to note here. Uh, there is not just one window. There are two windows. There's a session window, which holds for all the streams. And there is a per stream window. So the, um, and they're both in our traffic server implementation uh, set to the same value. So if we're starting with a 65535, then the session window is set to 65535 on the server side. And uh, saying that, you know, our client is not going to want to get more than 65535 data bytes before it comes back to us. And then each stream is also going to have that. So as we are sending the response body for stream one, uh, it's going to you know, send a certain amount of bytes. It's going to decrement the session window and the window for stream one. And then the response body to a data frame will, again, decrement the session window, decrement the, the window for stream two, and so on and so forth. And so most likely, uh, if these are relatively big bodies and it takes a while for the updates to come back, we're going to zero out our session window. And so while the stream windows will still have space in them, uh, we're going to stall out uh, and not send any more data bytes until we get the window updates back. Uh, and, and maybe that's what you want. Uh, but that's probably something uh, that this default window, if you're sending around large uh, entities, and it is a connection that has a lot of simultaneous connections on it, a lot of active connections, uh, the defaults are probably too small. Uh, in my production testing, uh, I, I made a code change to add a separate session window that just helped me get my head around things. So I made a session window setting and a regular, the initial window setting and made the session window much bigger. Um, in a, the issue that's discussing uh, the, the things here, the uh, Mazukatsu proposes dynamically adjusting the per stream window based on the number of active streams, which sounds fine. It sounds trickier, uh, so I think that would be a good phase two solution. You could also just up the current session window, hope it's big enough to cover everything. Um, but in any case, I think this is this tuning the data windows, particularly as we're going to origin with a lot of simultaneous reuse. I think this is gonna be moving forward, something that folks are gonna wanna very carefully analyze and tune. Uh, so trading off, reusing memory, using a lot of memory versus uh, throttling, over throttling, and, and increasing your latency. All right. Uh, let me quickly, I'm almost out of time here. So and we're officially over time. Oh, quickly, quickly. This is the good, uh, uh, the good uh, performance graph here. We're showing origin reuse comparison. So control versus 9.1 uh, with H2 enabled to two very active origins. So in the control case, our average reuse uh, to origin was, or sorry, median was three. And in the case where we enabled H2, our median is 69 and our high is like 53,000. So with H2 and things tuned right and some bug fixes, you can reuse those origins lot, 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 which is really good. And uh, the time, the times are a little better, um, not nearly as dramatic as the origin reuse, but uh, uh, it's, it's looking good, and uh, that's about it. There's gRPC stuff, but and future stuff. But are there any questions? And uh, I see Rob has something. Uh, said ATS normally makes one to two real H2 connections. With re increasing that, or making it configurable, mitigate the number of streams killed. Yeah, so there there is a setting. Uh, you can set the max concurrent count, and that's the current setting right now. And actually in my testing, I set it down from the max of 100, or sorry, the default of 100, I set it down to 50. You may want to even yeah, set it down to 20 or something. And that um, having, allowing fewer concurrent streams uh, would uh, reduce the impact of, of having a, a, a protocol error take your session down, definitely. All right, any other questions? Oh, yeah, plea, uh, plea here to please go test H2 to origin. 
it's fun. It's good. Thanks, Susan. All right. Thank you. <gasps>